So my question to study was, how does the environmental and health impacts of nuclear energy compare with energy created from renewables? Um, and I found this question, I, you know, in science, I also I, I find it difficult at times to separate um, economics and politics from it. Um, a lot of times the things that you read may have um, a bias or, or an agenda that they kind of want to push on you. Um, and I found it uh, especially the case while studying studying energy. Um, I think that's just part of it, but I, I just really had to uh, dive deeply into what I was looking at and just really read and pay attention to who the authors were. So sustainable versus renewable, that's kind of what this is about. We're talking about energy and how we want to uh, create a better world through cleaner energy. Um, but there is a difference between sustainable and renewable. So I'll start with renewable first. Um, so it's derived from a natural process um, that replenishes at a rate faster or equal to the rate at which it is consumed. Um, so in that case, if we think of something like wood, um, like our forests, that can be renewable, but if we keep using it at a rate much higher than we can plant these trees, then wood is not a renewable resource at all. Um, and then sustainable is just a resource that uh, we can use it for the foreseeable future without it running out, and it meets the demands of the society. Um, that's the difference between sustainable and renewable. So the three big renewables that I'm going to look at, there are a lot of renewables. But the ones I'm going to look at are hydroelectricity, wind energy, and solar energy. Um, so starting off with hydroelectricity, it uses the uh, kinetic power of flowing water to create energy. Um, this spins turbines, and that's how the, uh, mostly electrical, but also it can create mechanical energy. Um, Hydroelectricity is better in certain parts of the world. So obviously you need fast flowing water um, to create hydroelectricity. The more volume of water and the higher speed of that water, the more electricity or power that you can generate. Um, Canada is actually home to a ton of hydroelectric dams and hydroelectricity creates 59.3% of Canada's electricity. It's the second largest producer of hydroelectricity in the world. Some cons, kind of like I said before, it relies on fast flowing water. So if you don't have that water, it's kind of a negative. Um, I know California has a lot of hydroelectrics and they're going through some water problems or water security problems right now. So it does put a little bit of stress on that, on that energy source. Um, the graph here is a look at different provinces and territories in Canada. So you see that Quebec is a huge, huge um, beneficiary from hydroelectrics, and then BC also has a ton. Our prairie provinces don't have um, an, an overload of this type of energy, but they are better for different types of renewables, as you will see later on. Newfoundland also, on its size, has a very high amount of hydroelectricity. Now we're gonna look at wind energy, one of the fastest growing energies in the world, actually. So it's growing because there's a ton of interest in it. Um, a lot of oil companies are actually investing in wind energy and wind energy technologies as well. Um, and it, it's been getting cheaper and cheaper since Ch uh, China had a lot of wind energy, so in Germany, and it's kind of brought the cost down. Um, one thing to note about wind energy is that it currently it covers 3.5% of the electricity in Canada. Hydro energy had 59%, right? Oh, a little bit over 59%. So there's a huge discrepancy between these two renewable energies. I'm going to look at some smiley faces and some sad faces here. So a lot of the smiley faces are we've got a lot of money being poured into wind energy. Uh, it's clean energy, meaning that it's carbon free. Um, it, they're saying it powers an, uh, like approximately 3.4 million homes, which is absolutely awesome. Um, and then it's down here, over 1 billion investments in new wind energy. Great, perfect. Um, the, the sad faces, they've put increased pressure on endangered bird species. Um, and no, that's not, you know, robins and, you know, these tiny little birds. It's usually bigger birds, you know, hawks and eagles and things like that. 
Um, and you need a lot of space for turbines. So you need to clear the ecosystem, whatever that may be. Um, usually they're best on coastal lines, even offshore or in the prairie. So in the prairies, it'd be something like a grassland. Um, and they are in incredibly variable in the amount of energy they produce. So they have something called a capacity. So they don't usually run at that full capacity. They're usually down smaller, around 35% of what they can actually produce. And because of that, you need something to supplement it. Um, and you can't put wind turbines in the city. There's no space in the city. So that you need to have them out in the country out where there's a ton of space. And you need to have long lines to bring that into the city or to connect to the grids. That would be the negatives of wind energy. On to solar energy. So half of Canada's residential properties could be, could be provided electricity from a simple solar panel on top of the roof. Okay, so that's awesome. But now the problem with that is that energy from residential solar panels is actually about twice as expensive as energy created from a solar farm. So what a solar farm is, is it's just out outside of the city where in an area where they get a lot of sun and you just put a whole bunch of solar panels together to collect that energy. Now the problem with that is much like wind turbines, it needs space and you need a clear habitat, then you need to bring long lines into the city to get that energy. So wind and solar have kind of the same problems and they're not technical problems, they're natural problems. The, the sun isn't always shining and the wind isn't always blowing and because of that, they're somewhat unreliable energy sources. So now we're going to look at something that is not renewable. Nuclear energy is not renewable, but it is clean, meaning that it does not emit carbon dioxide or greenhouse gases. And it is sustainable. Okay, so nuclear energy is from the, uh, the process of nuclear uh, fission. So that's splitting a nucleus to create energy in the form of heat. Um, uranium is an incredibly dense resource, so that's why it is you know, a, a great resource. We've moved from wood, not very energy dense, to you know, fossil fuels and coal, which are more energy dense, and then uranium's even more so than that. And I think that will be um, great for the future moving forward because it's a dense and it's abundant. Um, this is just a couple of quick facts on Canada and uranium. So something that I thought was super interesting was that in 2018, Canada mined 7 kilotons of uranium valued at 900 million. This is actually down from what it was from about 2014 to 2018, um, but it's still a, a solid amount. And all of that uranium came from Saskatchewan. So Saskatchewan has three uranium mines. Um, two of which have actually closed down now, but we'll, we'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, and Canada is also the second biggest producer of an exporter of uranium in the world. So the pros of nuclear energy um, are that it takes less space. So like I was saying before that the solar needs about 450 times more land than nuclear and 17 times more material to produce the same amount of energy. So the picture you see here on the left is this is the Diablo Canyon nuclear power plant in California. It takes up about four football fields and it provides energy to three million Californians. We were saying before that wind provides energy and electricity to 3.4 million Canadians, but those wind turbines are spread out all across the country while this is a concentrated tiny little space that this takes up. The first thing we're going to look at is its reliability. So nuclear power, power plants generate electricity 92.3% of the time. This was a, a study in 2016 across the United States of America. So that's they're, they're running at full speed almost the entire year. Hydroelectricity, which is another great source of energy, ran at about 38.2% of the time um, or of, of its capacity. Wind delivered 34.5% of the time. Solar energy delivered 25.2% of the time. Um, and coal and natural gas generally operate right around 50%. Um, so in terms of reliability, nuclear is far and away the most reliable. 
Um, the difficult part about nuclear is that you can't really dial it down or dial it up very efficiently. That is what is nice about coal and natural gas. It's very easy to control, so they can bump that 50 up if they need to, and they can bump it down if they need to very quickly. Nuclear, you can't do that. And that's why um, uh, renewables are often paired with coal and natural gas, is because they have that ability to go up and down and be variable, because hydroelectric, wind, and solar are naturally very variable themselves. We were talking about decarbonizing before, and there's an article on this by Mark Nelson um, and a whole bunch of other authors that I've got outlined on the left there. And the study found that when wind and solar were deployed at the national level, very, very, very rarely did it have actually any impact on the national carbon levels or the carbon intensities. So they found that hydropower and nuclear have been much, much more effective in decarbonizing nations than solar and wind. Um, that's not saying that solar and wind don't work. Germany actually had a very successful time with, um, with wind energy and solar energy. But overall, on average, hydropower and nuclear energy have been much, much more effective. And I've got a graph here to kind of show that. So the different colors are different countries and their initiatives for energy just during an 11 year period. And you can see the red line there, that's Germany in 2001, I believe it was, with its initiative with wind energy and solar energy. And all the other ones are mostly nuclear. You see China is the gray line. That's all different types of energy. Um, and then up at the top, you've got Belgium, France, and Sweden deploying nuclear. So you can just grow and create energy so much quicker with nuclear energy and decarbonize so much faster. So it actually has an impact on the, on the climate, which is ultimately what we're trying to do a lot of the time with energy is to um, move away from these dirtier resources like coal especially um, and fossil fuels into cleaner energy sources like the ones I've outlined. So the study in the link below looks at California and Germany. And what it's trying to do is it's, it's a cost analysis between solar and wind and between nuclear. And what it shows is that nuclear energy is much more efficient at actually decarbonizing, mainly because it provides more energy, um, more reliably to an entire nation. Okay, so... What this study shows is that if Germany and California had put that money that they put into renewables instead into nuclear, that they would have far and away enough clean energy for all of their energy needs in their country. And then Germany would actually even have excess that they could export out of the country or that they could put into public transport. Down here is just a look at 10-year uh, deployments of different energy sources, nuclear, hydro, wind, and solar electricity. Um, so the most successful one down there is actually in Norway, and it's hydroelectrics. And then all the green ones, there's a ton of them, are, are nuclear. So they've been in incredibly effective. You see Germany's both on here. It's the first one is their solar, and about six or, or probably eight down is their wind energy. So they have been successful, but not successful to the level that hydroelectrics and uh, nuclear energy have been. The graph I'm showing here represents nuclear energy production around the world. So you notice that United States is on top. The next biggest, surprisingly, is actually France. So France has, I believe, over 40 nuclear reactors uh, across the country. And they rely very heavily on, on nuclear energy. So they get about 75% of their total energy from nuclear. And then uh, they get more also from hydro and wind. So about 93% of the energy that they produce in France is clean energy, which is awesome. Um, China is just below. And then you see Canada down below at about 4%. That's concentrated mainly in Ontario. Now that we've kind of looked at a lot of the good and a lot of the positives of nuclear energy, we're going to turn to the bad. Um, so the Fukushima disaster, which I'm sure you are familiar with, was a disaster in 2011. 
um, that was caused by an earthquake and a tsunami. So people within a 20 kilometer radius were evacuated for safety. But the disaster wasn't quite as bad as publicly perceived. It was the third one that's happened. There was a, a bad one in Three Mile Island in the United States, a bad one in Chernobyl, and then the, uh, Fukushima was the, the third one. But overall, the World Health Organization says that about 1.2% of the people who were involved in this accident will develop cancer from the radiation. And they also said that empirically speaking, the health effects from the disaster will be probably too small to measure. So although it was a very scary incident, um, I think a lot of the scare comes from lack of knowledge of what nuclear is and how the energy is maintained. So we're going to look at some safety now. The graph on the right is number of deaths from energy production. Um, brown coal and coal are very dirty resources that produce a lot of pollution. So that's what their deaths come from. Um, you know, a asthma and things like that and, and pollution. Um, when we get down to nuclear, this is involving their their cases, um, or sorry, the, the bad disasters that we've had. So the renewables like hydro and wind energy and solar, they sit down there with nuclear as well at, at very low um, death rates per production. One thing I do want to emphasize is that nuclear energy does not work the same as nuclear bombs. So nuclear bombs are very, very quick reactions where they're splitting the nucleus very, very quickly to create energy and create explosions. With nuclear energy, those reactions are very, very slow. So when we have a, a, a nuclear reactor go down or have a meltdown, it's not like we're releasing a nuclear bomb or something like that. That is a, a, a public perception that often hurts uh, nuclear. So I just wanted to kind of sure that up. Nuclear energy in the future. I should have put a big question mark instead of a globe here because I don't know what it will be and I'm not sure anybody really does. Um, I put the globe because I think it can be humongous for the globe in terms of um, creating an abundance and a sustainable amount of clean energy. But currently British Columbia has pr prohibited the use of nuclear energy and uranium mining. France, which I was bragging about before, is trying to reduce from 75% nuclear to down to about 50%. They're closing down a couple of their nuclear uh, power plants. Switzerland and Spain have said they're not constructing any new generators. And Belgium and Germany plan on phasing out the nuclear reactors that they have right now. Now, what does all this mean? First off, the, the price of uranium has dropped quite considerably. So you see on the graph on the right there, in 2007 it had a huge peak, probably a little bit too high because we had a couple couple mines closed down and lower supply. But then it found a kind of a solid spot. Because of there's been no projects, uh, places shutting down, policies by governments, it's been on a steady decline. Uh, recently, I don't have the end here, but it's starting to come up a little bit now again. What it's going to be like in the future, you know, we're not sure. But I've outlined MacArthur River uranium mine because it's got some of the highest grade uranium in the world. They actually shut down in 2017 and they're still shut down. The reason for this is because of an oversupplied market and cheap uranium prices. So they're not selling their high grade uranium in an oversupplied market just to, just to get low value on their, on their product. We th well, why not both? If nuclear is awesome and we like renewables, even though they are slightly variable at times, they still provide clean energy, why not both? Well, wind and solar energy must be coupled with and supported by another energy source because they are variable, like we were talking about before. Um, this is generally fossil fuels because they can be turned up and down. It can't be nuclear because you can't just dial it back. Therefore, if a country to use more wind and solar energy, if they were to deploy these things, they would also have to decrease their nuclear energy. And they would, because of that, have to increase in fossil fuels and increase in carbon emissions. So although we think of renewables as the way to go, um, it's not always um, the case. And it's not always the most beneficial thing for our planet. Um, 
I read that a lot of oil companies are actually purchasing um, and investing in a lot of these um, wind companies because wind, in a way, is dependent on fossil fuels. Um, so what it looks like for the future, uh, I'm not sure, and I think that's okay. Hey gang, so to conclude all of that, um, all that talking, basically what I think is that we know that nuclear energy is clean, we know it's sustainable. So with those two things, we can help um, use it to help us create a, a better climate, uh, combat climate change, and we can also use it uh, environmentally to help our ecosystems because it doesn't take up space. Now, what can we do in the future? Well, we can continue to maintain safe practices and find better practices, and we can um, find, uh, find different ways to improve public perception or find out why public don't necessarily like nuclear energy. Um, and that would be my recommendations and my thoughts, but thank you very much for watching my video. See you.